Okay, so today we're going to talk about the beginning of developmental psychology. Um, with developmental psychology, we go through the whole lifespan. So we have um, conception, we're going to start at conception, and we're going to end at death. And we divide the lifespan, this is called the lifespan, into different uh, categories. So the first category, we're going to talk about um, prenatal. Um, So, of course, that's, um, you know, prior to birth. And then we have infant. And infancy goes from zero to age two to two years old. Okay. Let me see. Maybe a black one might show up better. And the next is called early childhood. Hmm, I guess not. And this goes from about three to five or six. Think of early childhood as the preschool years, the years that, um, you know, that you're in preschool before you start kindergarten. Then we have middle childhood. And this goes from about six to about 11. Um, the thing with these ages is, is that they're not... Um, set in stone you know they they fluctuate a little bit it's not like okay you you know you turn 11 and now you you go into the next category they're a little more fluid or a little more flexible than that then we have adolescence adolescence goes adolescence is a little tricky as to when it begins and when it ends so adolescence can start really early um, and sometimes it ends a little bit later but we're going to say about 11 or 12 and it ends in theory at 18 when you become an adult when you become legally an adult that's when adolescence technically ends but we're going to talk about the differences and how adolescence is extending <clears throat> so we're going to say 18 to about 22 then you have early adult and early adult starts again around when adolescence ends so um, in theory, at 18. Now, interestingly enough, most people don't understand how long early adulthood goes. Most people think, you know, when do you go into middle age, middle adulthood? Um, a lot of people think, you know, 30, you know, when do you think middle adulthood starts? Well, with developmental psychology, middle adulthood doesn't start till about 40 or 45. So, you know, when you're in your 30s, you're still technically in early adulthood, dealing with all the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, early adults deal with. And we have <clears throat> middle adulthood, about 45 um, to about 60 or 65. And then we have late adulthood. And this goes from about 65 to death. <laughs> Whenever you die, you end late adulthood. And then the last topic that we cover is the death and dying process. So we go from conception, the beginning, uh, how life begins, and then we end at death. And this is what the whole course of developmental psychology is all about. All the things that we cover, all the, um, we're going to cover all of these. We're going to cover the physical aspects. We're going to cover the emotional, psychological, the social, what's going on in your environment and how all of those things affect us differently at different stages in our life. Now, throughout developmental psychology, we are dealing with what are called three reoccurring events. These are three things that um, become an issue throughout the entire lifespan, from, all the way from conception um, to death, and how they affect us and how they affect developmental psychology. So they're called reoccurring events that occur or reoccurring issues that are going to come out throughout the semester. The first one is the nature-nurture controversy. Many of you probably have heard of the nature-nurture controversy. 
the nature nurture <clears throat> controversy is all about what causes us to be the way we are. Is it nature? Now, nature, think of um, mother nature. Think of what you're born with, what you got from your genetics, your biological makeup. All of that is the nature side of the argument. So if, for example, um, intelligence, does your intelligence come from nature? Does it come from your biology? Does it come from your genetics? Did you inherit it? Where does your intellectual level come from? The other side of the argument is that it comes from nurturing. Nurturing is the environmental factor. So did it come, did your intelligence come from, you know, because you had good nutrition, because you had a very stimulating environment, because your parents, you know, really worked with you early on to help you to read and do math and, you know, all the things that we consider to be intelligence. So this issue of nature and nurture is going to come up over and over again in the course. Is, um, is, you know, menopause, puberty, you know, when does puberty start? Puberty is the changes that occur in your body um, that you go from a child to being an adult and your ability to reproduce. Does that happen because of nature or does it happen because of nurture? If you believe it's all nature, thinking, well, your bodies do that on their own, and so it's all 100% nature, then why is the age at which we mature, which we enter puberty, becoming earlier and earlier? You know, many years ago, 100 years ago, girls didn't start their periods till, you know, 14, 15. Now they're starting them at 11 and 12. It's getting earlier. So then the belief is, is that there must be some sort of nurturing part of that. So most things in psychology, most theorists in psychology believe that it's a combination of both nature and nurture, not just one or the other, that they combined to help us and create who we are and who we're going to be. So for example, when puberty starts, yes, part of it is inborn in our, um, in our biologies. We're all going to start puberty. It's just going to happen. People do it. It's, you know, if it doesn't happen, then there's something wrong. So we know that it's going to happen, which be the nurture side, the nature side of it. You know, it's, it's part of our biology. It's, we need to reproduce as, you know, human beings to keep our, you know, um, species going. But when it occurs, sometimes can be affected by nature, uh, by nurture. If you, um, for example, like gymnasts, they're very thin and they don't have a lot of muscle. I mean, a lot of, they have a lot of muscle. They don't have a lot of fat. Well, for you to start your period, for girls to start their period, they have to have a certain amount of body fat. So what happens is because of the nurturing side, the environmental side, because they don't have a lot of fat in their body, it delays it. So yes, they're going to go through it, but it delays it. So it's a combination of nature and nurture. Intelligence, the same thing. We believe we're born with a certain amount of intelligence, but the environment can affect that intelligence as well. Either stretch it to its full capacity or actually even decrease it. So we're going to go through all of this, this whole nature-nurture issue in the different um, areas that we go through when we look at developmental psychology. Um, the next reoccurring issue is the idea of um, continuity versus discontinuity. Is something continuous or not? That's what this whole um, idea is. If it's continuous continuity, it continues in the same way. It's cumulative. The growth, the development is cumulative. If it's discontinuity, then there's um, a disruption. Something's different. Something changes in our development. Um, for example, if we, if we plant a tree, a little tree, a sapling, what's called sapling, um, if we plant that, uh, an oak tree, let's say, it's going to slowly grow and grow and grow and grow and grow into a bigger oak tree. It's not going to change into, 
you know, an apple tree. It's going to start out as an oak tree, but very small, but yet there's going to be continuous growth until it grows into a bigger oak tree. Now, a caterpillar will, you know, be a caterpillar and then it will, you know, go into the cocoon and then it comes out as a butterfly. As it grows and develops, it doesn't grow and develop into a bigger caterpillar. It grows and develops into a butterfly. That's that's discontinuing. It's not continuing the same thing, okay? So there's many things in developmental psychology when we look at this that are either, you know, some things appear to be continuous, but actually they're not, or some appear to be this way. And so we're going to look in more detail about this. For example, with a child, um, give you an example, language development. With language development, it seems as if you know, the child is just making all these weird sounds that don't seem to make any sense to us. And all of a sudden they say their first word. So it seems like it's discontinuous. It seems like it's different. Like there's a big change in it when actually language development is continuous. It's the same. There's these steps that everybody goes through and it actually is just building. So we hear babies coo and we hear them babble and then we hear them say their first word, but it's all connected. It's not some big change. It's all connected leading up to the first word. So we're going to talk about um, these things with, um, you know, do we, if, is somebody this way since childhood or is there an abrupt change in their development and something that causes them to be completely different? The third um, reoccurring issue is universal versus context, contextual. So universal means that everybody goes through it, no matter where you live on the planet, no matter if you're you know, born and raised in America, you're born and raised in China, every human being is going to go through it. So it's universal. It's across the whole universe. Context means that the change is due to the um, environment in which you live. So your culture um, creates these context changes that occur. So, for example, again, back to language development, the part, there's part of language development is universal. The part of language development that's universal, and we're going to go in this great detail when we get to language development, is that first you coo, first you cry, then you coo, then you babble, then you have your first word. It's the same. Regardless if you're born in the United States or you're born in some remote island somewhere, you're going, all babies cry, then they coo then they babble, then they say their first word. What that first word is, is based on the culture in which they live, the word that they hear. So the um, development of language is universal, but what language we speak is context, okay? So it's different. Um, all of these three things, the nature versus nurture, the um, uh um, continuity versus discontinuity, sorry, and the universal versus context are all intertwined. They're all, you know, together, um, so to speak. They all um, are mixed, and we're going to go through them. We're going to see how they're different at different stages of development. So these issues will come up throughout the whole semester. And the other thing with developmental psychology is there are different theories of developmental psychology. So we have these theories. And these theories believe that we become who we are for in different ways based on the premise of the theory. Now, if you took introduction to psychology, then you know that there are different theories. There's psychodynamic and there's behaviorism and learning theory and cognitive theory. And so in developmental psychology, they're the same. In other words, we have these same theories, but it's how they affect our development or the person's change throughout their lifespan. So the first theoretical perspective that we're going to talk about is the psychodynamic theories.
doesn't seem right. That doesn't look right. psychodynamic theorists. And the person who is the most uh, well-known in this area is Freud. So if you've taken Psych 101, you're very familiar with Freud. We talk about Freud a lot. We're going to talk about Freud in this class as well. The psychodynamic theorists believe that um, at most of who we are, who we become, is do is happens in childhood. That what happens in our childhood is very important. What happens in our childhood makes a huge difference in who we are, who we become, the person that we are. And so the psychodynamic theorists believe that there is um, what they call everything with psychodynamic theorists is you know sex and aggression, because what they believe in is that what we're born with. So what we're born with, the part of us that is due to the naturing side, is the id. It's just simply id. The id. The id is um, this thing that we're born with. It's innate. Um, it's uh, pl It works on the pleasure principle. The id wants pleasure. It wants it now. It doesn't care how it gets it. It doesn't care about anything except satisfying its own need for pleasure. And what the id has to work with is our libido and aggression because we're born with those as well. Those are instincts that we're born with. And so the id goes along and think about a baby when it's first born. According to the psychodynamic theorists, it's just one big id. It's just all about itself, right? If it's hungry, it's crying at two o'clock in the morning. It doesn't care if you have a test the next day. It's just, I want food. I want it now. I don't care what it takes. Just get it to me. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. And if that means crying and crying and crying and having a fit and screaming and doing whatever I need to do, that's what I'm going to do. That's the id. Okay, so the it is all self-centered, all about pleasure, wanting pleasure, whatever it does to make me happy. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do whatever it takes, whatever I can use to get you to get me what I need. OK, now some people stay one big id and you may know some of them, you know, they're they it's all about them and it's all about their pleasure and their happiness. And, you know, who cares about you? That's it. But for most people, as we grow in childhood, we then develop what's called our ego. The ego works on what's called the reality principle. The ego is all about. Um, trying to control the id because if we grow up to be one big id you know we're self-centered people don't like us you know maybe we're even turn out to be a, what we call an antisocial personality disorder which you call a sociopath is like you know it's all about me and I don't care if I have to kill you to get what I want that's what I'm going to do you know that would be could be an id but the ego needs to control the id. And the ego has all these tricks in its bag, defense mechanisms, all kinds of things to help control the id. Because the ego, again, works in the reality principle. And what that means is it has to work with reality. You know, we can't just go around expecting everybody to cater to us like the big id. We won't get along in society. And we're social beings. We need to be able to get along in society. So we need our ego to help control the id. Then as we keep growing and developing, we um, in uh, early childhood, and we'll talk about this when we get to early childhood and talk about the Oedipus complex and all of that. But what develops out of that is the superego. The superego is that little voice inside your head, usually sounds like your parents, that is... Um, uh, your morals, your values, following the rules, um, you know, wanting to do everything right. So as we're growing up, according to the psychodynamic theorist, Freud, we are developing this superego. And we usually develop it by identifying with our parents. Parents. We want to take on their morals and values. They teach us the sense of right or wrong. They teach us how to get along in society, what rules we have to follow to get along in society. And that's the superego. Now, if our superego is really super strong and it's really 
Um, if we're all about the super ego, then we're very rigid. We're very controlling. We follow every rule to the letter. You know, we don't want to ever mess up or ever get in trouble. Everything has to be just so can create um, a little bit of what we call obsessive compulsive personality, not obsessive compulsive disorder, but that's um, another class. You know, those people that everything has to be perfect. So if, you know, if I have my water bottle here on the desk and that's where I keep it and you come in and move it, when I come in, I got to move it back because that's where it goes in my book. And everything has to be the same all the time that need to be perfect, that need to be follow all the rules. So the superego is a little too strict. The it is not enough. The superego is too much. So the other part of the ego's job is to also mediate the superego. It's kind of like this, you know, I want to, um, I want you to loosen up a little bit, lighten up a little bit, you know, don't be so strict. So the ego's job is to mediate between the id and the superego. It's like the mediator to keep these two happy. And, you know, when you've um, seen movies and they, um, so the, the person in the movie is trying to make a decision and they've got a devil on one side and an angel on the other side. Well, the devil is the id saying, do it, do it. We want fun. We want fun. The superego is like, no, we're going to get in trouble. Stop doing that. And it's the ego's job, the person in the middle to try to mediate between the two. Um, let me give you an example, just, um, uh, an example, you don't need to know this, but it kind of explained the superego uses what we call defense mechanisms to mediate these two. That's kind of one of the things in the back. One of the defense mechanisms is called sublimation. And so sublimation means that we take something that the id wants to do, but would get us in a lot of trouble. So the superego would go crazy, but we, we need to be able to mediate as the ego to keep the superego and id happy. So let's say your id thinks, you know what? I want to cut up people. I want to see what's inside of them. I want to know what's going on. I'm just going to start cutting up people because that seems fun to me. Well, of course, the superego is going to go crazy. We can't do that. We're going to get arrested. We're going to be in trouble. We can't go around killing people. That's so the ego. How do I satisfy both the id and the superego? So the, the ego says, okay, we're going to become a surgeon. Can a surgeon cut people up and see what's inside? Does that satisfy the id? Absolutely. The super ego, is a, are surgeons allowed to cut people up? Do they get a lot of praise and money for cutting people up or saving their lives? Absolutely. That satisfies the super ego. So the ego has done a good job in satisfying both the id and the super ego, living in reality, saying we're going to be a surgeon. So you can see how all three of these parts of the personality um, work together. And this is the basics of the psychodynamic theory. There's much more to it. They do um, stages of development. Many of the theories have what we call stages of development, meaning that they believe as we go through life, especially in childhood, we go through different stages and are faced with different things. With psychodynamic theorists, with Freud, his stages are called psychosexual stages. Again, because for Freud, he believes that we're born with the libido, which is our, our sexuality, our sex, you know, sex drive, so to speak. And so he believes that at each different stage, and we're going to go through these stages as we go through the class. Now, in your first chapter, you're going to see Freud's um, psychosexual stages. Maybe um, you're going to see Erickson's um, uh, psychosocial stages and Piaget's cognitive stages. You don't need to memorize them here because when we get to early childhood, we're going to talk about Freud's psychosexual stages, the psychosocial stage, and the cognitive stage. When we get to adolescence, we're going to talk about what adolescents are going through. So I like to take these stages and um, just apply them to the stage that we're actually in or that we're studying at the time. So you need to know about Freud, um, you know, the id, ego, and superego, that all this happens in childhood, that a lot of who we become, he believes our personality is based on what happens in childhood, um, but you don't need to memorize his stages, okay? So that's Freud. He is one of the psychodynamic theorists. Another of the psychodynamic theorists is Erickson. 
Eric Erickson. He studied under Freud. Um, he thought Freud put a little too much emphasis on sex. So um, <clears throat> he didn't see that um, as important as um, society. He believed that society was a, played a big part in our development and who we become is how society and us, you know, interact together. So Freud, I mean, Erickson, sorry, Erickson has these psycho stages as well that we go through in childhood, but his stages are called psychosocial. He calls them psychosocial stages of development, again, because he believes that it's society that plays an important role in our development and affects our development and how and who we how we become who we are. He has eight stages. He believes that our development starts at birth and goes all the way till death. For Freud, the stages end at adolescence. So Erickson took it further than that because he believed that even as adults, we're continuing to develop, we're facing different issues as adults. And so we're facing different issues in late adulthood than we were in, in early adulthood. And so that affects us. Erickson believes that each stage there's a crisis and you will end up on one or the other. There's two sides of the crisis. So when we resolve the crisis, we either end up on this side or this side. So all of his stages, like his first stage is trust versus mistrust. So what's happening is the child, the infant, and again, we'll go through this in more detail when we get to infancy. The first stage, you know, the child is learning to trust society. Is society going to take care of me? If society takes care of me, somebody feeds me when I'm hungry, somebody changes my diaper, makes sure that I'm warm and, and I'm taken care of, then I learn to trust society that every that people will be there for me. If nobody comes when I'm hungry and nobody takes care of me and I, it's just not good, I don't know what to do, then I end up on mistrust, okay? So there's a crisis at this stage, the first stage, what, you know, I need my needs met and how are they going to be met? And that's the crisis. And then either they're resolved with a sense of trust or they're resolved with a sense of mistrust. So when we go through the stages of development, the different categories, the different groups, we're going to talk about each of Erickson's stages. So the, in infancy, we'll talk about trust versus mistrust. In adolescence, we'll talk about identity versus identity confusion. So we're going to talk about them each separately again. So they're presented all here in your book in this first chapter, but you don't need to memorize them here because we're going to go through them. But you do need to know that again, for Erickson, this whole psychodynamic theorist for him, again, our childhood is very important. It stays with us. This crisis, whichever side of the crisis we end up on stays with us and affects us later on in life. So for example, trust versus mistrust. Let's say you end up on the side of mistrust. Nobody takes care of you. You're, you do, so you, you don't trust that society and people are going to do that. <clears throat> when we get to early adulthood, where um, the crisis is um, intimacy versus isolation. We're trying to form intimate relationships or we end up isolated. If we don't trust people, so if in infancy, we learn not to trust people. We go through, now we're here at intimacy versus isolation. How can we form intimate relationships if we don't trust people? We can't. So you can see how for Erickson, what happens in our early life stays with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we end up on the side of trust, then good. We can trust people. We can know that people are going to be there for us. So when we're trying in early adulthood to form intimate relationships, we can do that because we trust that people will be there for us, take care of us, especially our partners and who we form intimate relationships with. So Erickson and Freud and this whole psychodynamic theory is about how what's going on, especially in our childhood, affects us later on in life. It's a big premise of their theory. Erickson and Freud see it a little bit different, what's going on, but that's the basic premise of the psychodynamic theorists. We talked about Freud and Erickson. There's other um, psychodynamic theorists as well, but we're just going to talk about those two here. 
Okay. Um, the next theorist is the uh, learning theorist. Um, that's kind of... I'm going to do the cognitive theorist first because it, it, the learning theorists are long and this lecture is already getting long and I know you guys can only pay attention for so long. So the cognitive theorists. Cognitive means what? Your cognition is what? Your cognition is anything that has to do with thinking. So your thoughts, your decision making, your problem solving, um, your intelligence, all of that is, is our cognition. So when I talk about cognitive or cognition, I'm talking about everything that's going on up there in the brain. Now, the theorist who did the most work in this area and that we're going to talk about is Piaget. It's Piaget. It's P-I-A-G-E-T. He's a French guy, Jean Piaget. Um, it's not P-J. Um, so it's Piaget. And Piaget has this whole idea that our cognition, our thoughts, our thinking, our intelligence, decision making develops in childhood so that a two year old doesn't think the same as a six year old. The six year old doesn't think the same as a 10 year old. 10 year old doesn't think the same as a 15 year old. So as we grow and develop and we go through um, our childhood, our cognitive abilities change and grow and develop with us. So he has a stage theory as well. And his stage theory is called cognitive theory, cognitive um, stage theory. So it's just, you know, cognitive. So we have Freud's psychosexual stages. We have Erickson's psychosocial stages. And we have Piaget's cognitive stages of development. And again, I know they're presented in your book, but you do not have to um, memorize them at this point. When we go to, um, to infancy, we'll talk about his first stage. And then we go, we'll talk about a pre-operational stage, concrete operation, formal operations, sensory motor stage is the first one. We're going to talk about each of those as we get to those stages um, in the, throughout the semester. So um, let's see. Okay. And so I'm going to end this one here. Um, and then I'll continue with these theories and then we'll, um, we'll go forward after that. Again, if you have any questions, you can um, email me, text me or wait for the Zoom and you're free to ask um, any questions at that point.